to ask you, do you think that the architecture and the urban landscape is kind of following what is rapidly going on in the realm of technology and how it's used? We, talk, we, we talked about sound pollution, we talked about uh, frequency pollution, uh, we could talk about virtual reality entering our real world, etc. Uh, any ideas or any thoughts on, on that? How is the, the, the architecture as a sort of physical space reacting to uh, the challenges that uh, technology is posing us on different levels? So the question is, how does it... Um, or or, or do, do you think, it, it, do, you, do, do you feel that it, it is in a way following, uh, following the developments since the city as an organism, as an architectural organism now is not just a physical entity, it can be deformed through various technological means, etc. Well, I think that, especially as we have seen in your talk, is um, there's... Uh, the way how some specific technologies, like putting up speakers everywhere, are are um, are used in a in a way uh, without really thinking about what are the consequences of of doing that. Um, so I think in that regard, uh, the city is reacting to that. On the other side, from an architectural point of view, it's um, and a reaction is doesn't work that fast. So you cannot rebuild the whole city. You don't want to rebuild the whole city based on technological advances. It doesn't really make sense. Um, so I think it's, yeah, it's both things at the same time. It's either on one side, it's not really reacting to that, which is good, so it preserves something. Um, on the other side, there's, especially here, um, a lot of um, yeah, usage of architecture, uh, architecture of, of technology um, that is not really thought through in the first place. If, 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 we, if we enter a smaller part of, uh, of architecture, so-called private space, where, where, where we all live, we have, we have two realities. On one hand, the technology that we use excessively is getting quieter and quieter, but on the other hand, the amount of noise around us is uh, is getting enormous in, in various forms, not just sound, but the information, data, uh, radio waves, uh, etc. Um, <clears throat> how is this affecting us in a way, and how sh how should uh, how should we react to that? Yeah, I'm not sure I'm going to answer that exactly, but I'm going to make a couple of observations. Um, so I think that there's like, yeah, with, with the kind of prevalence of technological bleed, there's a like retraction of people into their own space. So if you look around as you navigate a city or transport systems or something, you'll find that everybody's immersed in their own headphones and their own phones. So there's a kind of interesting conflict there around the fact that we're getting bombarded with more information, but yet people are actually retract into their own space. I think mean, going back to what you were saying about the, the way that, um, yeah, maybe like, I'm not really sure it's architecture changing the space, but it's an impact of um, the way that we use spaces. So there's the kind of classic example of putting um, like high frequency uh, noise in certain public areas to stop you know, teenagers hanging around, you know, on street corners and stuff. And so there's this, like, sanctioning of certain areas of the city that kind of draws these lines. Um, so, yeah, it's just, I mean, as I say, I'm not sure that directly relates to what you're saying, but it's just kind of, what's the way, things that I've observed, but perhaps in the same way. Yeah. Uh, Martin talked about the distribution of uh, radio frequency, and you mentioned the use of, uh, high s sound frequency in public spaces to control uh, to control the public um, and uh, there is a question again of, of uh, legality of such doings is that at all permissible or legal or should be 
in a way to to disturb the people with the, these kind of frequencies and these kind of methods. I mean, this is quite a militant use of sound in a way. Well, it's. Uh for me, it's interesting, uh, the old part of Ljubljana, which we are observing and specializing in observation, uh, are the two places which would be perfect for public performance, for public gathering, talking, blah, blah. And of both spaces, uh, they have a water fountain just in the middle. And the water fountain with nice white noise-like uh, noise, it's great for covering the traffic noise. Like they build fountains in the high traffic areas and they somehow even out <coughs> this disturbing dramaturgy of traffic noise with nice water falling and so it's cool. But in these parts of Old Ljubljana there's no traffic whatsoever. <coughs> They're totally quiet, but you cannot talk there, you cannot make music, you cannot perform because of loud waterfall. And this waterfall, one is uh, down by the Nook, uh, Misni Turk, the other one is in front of Musical Academy. Great performing places, not possible to perform. And these fountains are now much louder, the water goes higher than uh, I remember any time in the history when the traffic was around. Mm -hmm. And who put the fountains <laughs> in that space? Who turn them up so loud? Yeah. Why they are not synchronized to some, I don't know, church bells tolling, which are annoying some people, and fountain would go uh, an every hour together with bells up or mm -hmm. something, or I don't know, uh, motor uh, passing by a bit louder and fountain would go up. No, it's up all the time. Yeah. And uh, we lost public space. I mean, we lost silence in public space, and if there is no silence, there is no uh, deep discussion or no uh, music or any cultural mm -hmm. event. Uh, one question was before, what can we do not using music, noise, uh, yeah, uh, uh, to cover, like in public restaurant, if there's silence, uh, you hear people talking by the next table and it's not really convenient. So we abuse music just to get the privacy. Put music louder and you don't hear next table talking. Well, could be any kind of recordings. Uh, doesn't need to be music. It can be uh, bird singing or for or, that. Or music was invented years ago yeah, for such uh, purposes. <laughs> Yeah, uh, d mainly there's not uh, no vocal, it's not offensive, so it's not disturbing so much, but there are nicer, uh, I have a nice collection of recorded human voices, people just talking. And uh, when I'll be ruler of the world, and I will forbid playing music in public spaces, <laughs> I will be able to sell my sound libraries of just people talking and laughing. <laughs> and uh, empty public spaces would feel full with uh, happy people talking. <coughs> you, you all live in big European metropolis, well, you're not anymore in London, and uh, Marseille, <laughs> Berlin, um, and uh, what you mentioned, the honest uh, years ago there was <coughs> still active but apparently not so active theory of a Canadian guy called Soundscape and uh, through that it came, came to, um, to sound ecology and stuff like that but do you, do you have the feel in the towns that you are coming in the cities that uh, the, the city legislators uh, are taking uh, account of um, things like noise pollution or how certain sound can enter the city and create its ambient and etc. <laughs> yeah, um, maybe this is related to the previous question and discussions, as you said, but I think we um, all this annoyance and strange noises disturbing us is just a, a consequence of um, maybe um, people do, don't um, people who rule cities uh, construction and stuff like that 
don't take uh, in account the, the fact that we have to, take, uh, to think globally. We just, uh, the, the city is not just uh, a street and a plus a house, plus a street, plus a house. We have to think globally. I would also, I, I could also quote um, John Schoening, who I would say created uh, frequency modul modulation synthesis. He was uh, writing um, that we have to think about the space where we will put noise when we are uh, starting to compose this noise. And at least this is not the right quote. This was not noise, but music. But I think uh, the guy who built this fountain <laughs> should just have um, thought about where we, uh, where I will put this fountain. I mean, uh, this is not just like a physical element. Like the fountain is producing a small noise; it will be cool or nice. But if we put this fountain in a place, in a silent place, we only hear this fountain. And this example was was really interesting. I think we have to think glo more globally, and it will maybe the, the I would say the challenge could be to, um, to to open our eyes wider to see, maybe to think the, the, the time more long term time. At least this is like ecology. I mean, this is related to, to this. So if we don't do that, actually we'll have some glitches in our uh, urban landscapes. I'm sure about that. It's not just my uh, small presumption. Um, yeah, I think. <laughs> For, for me, I'm living in Berlin, I've always, um, luckily, always had the, uh, yeah, the luck to live in uh, apartments which were close to big uh, construction sites. So thinking about living in a silent environment, um, especially as a... Which is quite hard not to live which is, which is quite construction hard. site in Berlin. Um, it's, yeah, this is the point. Um, so there's a lot, yeah, well, wherever you go, wherever you just move to another place, think, well, it's, it's probably going to get better. I'm luckily now in the, my newest apartment in the position um, that it's actually silent there, and I'm, I'm actually quite happy about that. Um, in the end, I also used to live in, uh, in Sao Paulo last year, and what's interesting about Sao Paulo, not so much uh, about the, the acoustic noise, but about visual noise, is that a couple of years ago, they outlawed uh, visual advertisement in the city, which means you will not find any visual advertisement throughout the whole city of Sao Paulo, which is pretty big, it's 20 something million people living there. Um, this is in no other city in South America, you find that. And uh, you realize, you don't really realize that in the first place when you get to this, in a city like this, especially as um, this city itself is already visually noisy already through different types of, um, of architectural styles, lots of people around all the time. But you will realize that the moment you get out of the city, you get into another city, you see, okay, something's really wrong. Something is um, in a way that I, I, don't, I can't stand that anymore. So it's something that's very, um, very relational. So if you're used to, um, used to silence, you will get, you will have a problem with, with a lot of noise. If you're used to noise, you might even have a problem with silence. So there's this nice story about these people living at the, the Niagara Falls that they would um, wake up in the middle of the night because there's there was no water coming through the falls and they were like they were used to all that noise all the time and at some point there was silence so for them it was like they were. Um, uh, somebody was um, it was the same as somebody would be screaming outside of a, of a window here, um, but for them it was just the absence of noise that was for them the real noise in that regard. So it's it's very relational, um, and yeah, maybe that's what I wanted to say about yeah. that. Uh, I I think like especially in an urban environment, but not exclusively. Um, we are sort of like immersed in some sort of back, continuous background noise anyway. And uh, <coughs> do you think that so-called silence, which actually doesn't exist, but uh, <clears throat> is uh, in modern times commodified, you know what I mean? I mean, 
you will pay more for a silent part of the city to live in than, uh, than for a, to rent an apartment in a noisier part. <laughs> I think we can agree on that. I, <laughs> um, yeah, it's a. Um, Silence is good to to live. Yeah, but it's bad for business. That's the problem with silence. It's destroying capitalistic economy. If you have a moment of silence, you have a moment to reflect the moment to introspect, a moment to think what are you doing. Do I really need uh, new shoes or do I have some bills at home waiting for me? Yeah. So when you're walking downtown and it's nice cheesy music, oh, choo, 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 it's just this little switch. When you're undecided, it just switches you over. And uh, it works. <laughs> All fashion shops <laughs> do have to play music. They wouldn't sell anything without our music. And my question, which is always unanswered, is how much do we get paid for this? Basically nothing. And music economy is devastated, it's destroying, and the world common, uh, economy is blooming on the support of music, being supported by the music and not giving anything back. So basically, we are living in a very parasitic society, uh, sucking blood <coughs> out of artists, and that's it. And it's just too big business for anyone to come close. There is so much interest for all this money generated by the music not coming to the creators, because it's just too much money, too much profit. Yeah. And it would be really nice, uh, I mean, for musicians, I'm 100% sure it would be the best. We would be very rich, we would live happily if the music in public spaces would be forbidden. We would have uh, downtown nightclubs in the cellar and they would pay us tremendous money just um, to make music there. And it would be totally illegal and we would earn a lot. <coughs> and people will be hungry for music. Yeah. Now we have state politics which uh, steals our music and gives it away to the commercial enterprises basically for free. It's peanuts. Yeah. Uh, the Zvezda top location in the center of Ljubljana pays for one month of music, 16 hours each day, 7 euros and half. They get this money back like in <coughs> 10 seconds <laughs> yeah, because they have high prices. Uh, basically, and uh, uh, architecture is slowly responding to all this, and uh, I think it's uh, adjustability, adaptability, the key to survival. We have to adjust and adapt to survive, and architecture is slowly doing. But the problem is that we are not uh, adjusting to better quality of life, but we are adjusting to high profit and basically instant profit. Yeah. Nobody is asking, no city mayor, not even a commercial director of any commercial enterprise, what will be like in five years, in ten years, where we're heading to. No, no, it's the end of the season. In December, we have to put our bills and our balances, our results, and that's it. So short-term profit, how much can we earn in short term, no matter what happens. So basically, we are selling our future. Yeah. And uh, I think like in this, in this context, the, the use of music in public spaces basically reduces music to a sort of background noise. It's, yeah. not, it's certainly not used as music. Um, <clears throat> but do you think like there, when there is a, a lack of legislations for public spaces or more or less they are dictated by, by money, uh, 
there is a lot more of legislation and rules uh, to try to uh, specialize places for music, for clubs, etc. Uh, this is sort of uh, a bit paradoxical in a way. No, no, no. If we think about government as a control, uh, power needs more power. Government wants to have more control, and street musicians are pretty dangerous. They are totally uncontrollable. The uh, the city council doesn't know what to do with them, how to deal with them. Will they come or they won't? They have no clue. And they are frightened because of freedom. They want control. And it's much easier to rent per share no space to a guy who promises you two concerts each week. And to our city council, we're happy. We have control. Two concerts per week will be on public space. And it doesn't matter if these concerts are total bullshit. If these musicians are really bad, they don't know how to tune their instruments. And 50 meters away, it's a great band performing. Top shit musicians, street musicians, and you cannot listen to them, to those good guys who came here for nothing because their city council sponsored bad musicians on a top shit place with loud PA. So we are giving public money away to destroy something which is ha would be happening if there would be no public money. Why? Well, the only logical answer I could find is total control. The government is afraid of freedom for the artists. They cannot control them. They don't know what are they doing and how are they doing and why and so on. So they're basically lost. If they have control, they have kind of sense we are in control of everything. And yeah, as I said, not vision, but provision, that's the key. Um, talking about big cities, we, can, we cannot avoid uh, certain processes that are going on now for quite some time, maybe it's not so much. Here in Ljubljana, we are too small, but now if you live in London, and uh, London has been heavily gentrified in the last 10 years, so um, how is this affecting the, 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 the musical landscape, the club culture that you are a part of? I mean, we, we read the story about fabric now, etc. Uh, yeah, I mean, so, like, I'm not sure, like, I'm not sure how much more the gentrification has happened in the last 10 years. I mean, I guess there's always some sort of like exponential end to the curve yeah. as you run out of space, but um, I'm sure if you ask people 30 years ago, they would say a similar thing in certain areas. But it, I mean, it's true that we're reaching some saturation. Um, I suppose areas like Hackney that were traditionally kind of unloved London boroughs that were like a haven for artists and, and to operate within um, have become saturated. Um, and so there's a, like I'm increasingly hearing stories of people kind of looking further afield and going out to like the South Kent coast, all these kind of commuter belt areas that, because um, the problem in London as well is that like the, the immediate commuter area is saturated with people that commute into the city to work. And so the property prices around there are like incredibly expensive anyway. So you have to go kind of beyond that and basically you hit water. So it's, <laughs> it's like as far as you can go before you hit the channel. So there's like millions down in like Margate and Hastings and all of these kind of places that people are looking to find cheap rent. And, um, and then in terms of, I mean, it, like, there's a real irony going on at the minute with the fabric situation because so there's this talk of London becoming a 24-hour city because you know it, it never has been. Um, and so a couple of the tube lines are now open um, on a weekend late so people can get home without taxis and stuff. Um, so in the midst of that, in the midst of trying to sort of like, and that they were appointing this nighttime czar to oversee this process and try and, yeah, I don't know, like encourage like yeah, the nighttime activity. And then on the one hand, and then on the other hand, they, they said that we're gonna shut down arguably the most famous club in the city. Um, and so it's difficult. I mean, there's conspiracy theories around what's going on with that. And I really don't know what the ins and outs of it are. I mean, 
you know, there are some facts that you can't overlook that there have been deaths in the club um, mm -hmm. that are obviously politically uh, difficult to ignore. Um, I mean, someone rightly pointed out that, you know, like it's, you can't deal with like drugs in an open way, but everybody knows that drugs and clubs go hand in hand. And if you start to reason about it kind of sensibly, you're like, well, if there have been, I think there's been like five deaths in the last two years. Um, if you compare that to kind of alcohol-related um, injuries and deaths, and then you get that, like, probably last night in Ljubljana, I don't know, like, it's, you know, it's, the, the stats are kind of crazy. So it's difficult to sort of see that as a justification, um, yeah. but it's incredibly problematic. I mean, you know, like, I don't really have a great affinity with Fabric as a club, um, but I can see that it's incredibly important on the landscape of things, and it's, you know, it's a, uh, it's a sign that things are moving in the wrong direction. Mm. And it's not, it's not the way to kind of encourage people. I mean, if you look at, I don't know, I mean, yeah, maybe Martin's got a different view living in Berlin, but there's the kind of, you know, techno tourism for, for Bergheim, and they've got their own way of dealing with kind of the crowd that they want to enter the venue to try and keep some <laughs> authenticity to it. But, you know, like fabric would be like the kind of equipment people would take a flight to London to, to come and see the big names playing there. So, yeah, and, there's, and it's, that's at the end of a lot of, a lot of other clubs being shut down as well. Mm -hmm. But I, I kind of think that's just part of the progress, and I think that you know, new, new spaces open up and new things happen. Mm -hmm. um, uh, <clears throat> and Julian, you, you both <clears throat> create music, so in recent years, especially, uh, the opening of so so called sound art field. I think like the, the the notion of space really have more <clears throat> has increasingly entered the the, the 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 musical landscape in a, in a way. So how do you each individually approach uh, the space through sound and vice versa? Um, sound in the space and space in the sound. <laughs> I would say um, I'm very interested by uh, individual experience in space. I mean, um, maybe this is because I'm, I'm interested by perception. So um, I'm trying to, <coughs> I would say, to, to work with uh, specific sounds. I talked about a bit my work about uh, reverberation and. Um, lack of reverberation in adequate conditions, but this is also how a sound can be, uh, can propagate in space. And I'm interested by how each individual can feel that. Um, maybe this is also because I think that um, we can change our, it's, I would say, our feelings by uh, just uh, changing uh, the space where where we are working, maybe because of the environment and visual elements, but also because of the sound and how the sound is changed by the space. So um, this is not like uh, talking about maybe this is related to <laughs> to I would say sound propagation as a therapy, <laughs> maybe, but. Uh, how um, how sound can change you actually? This is why I'm interested by this part of uh, yeah of uh, some of my uh, activities. And um, in the lab uh, with which I'm collaborating in France, uh, there are a lot of uh, psychoacousticians. So this is very interesting to understand um, if we have um, sound movement in a space, we are more I would say um, more. Uh, how could I say that? More disorientated or disoriented, or less disoriented, or more stable or less stable. And uh, with my uh, installations, I'm trying to to address this kind of elements. The idea would be to give to the audience a um, new experience. I'm more interested by um, sensors, um, sensorial experiments than in music. So. I think this is um, this these different elements can directly uh, connect with some specific part of our mind or 
I don't know. Maybe I didn't find my way. I see it is very personal uh, to do that by using you know, so <laughs> I don't know. So I'm using very micro tonal stuff, even not tonal stuff, like noise and saturation to just uh, contact um, each part of your <coughs> brain. Maybe this is because I want to control everything. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. <laughs> anyway, this is like, maybe this is more because I, I'm interested by talking about uh, what I have in mind and what I maybe expressing myself. And I'm interested by how people can feel that. So I'm just trying to have the less, less gap between what I'm trying to express and what they could feel. You know, maybe this is my... What I what, uh, what I call control is not like controlling mind, but more controlling myself actually. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, yeah. yeah, I mean yeah, it's, it's kind of very similar actually for me. Um, it's always been about the, the physical effect or the effect of sound, I guess, but also visual stuff as well. And it's kind of there's like two different arenas for it. So the, on Friday, the performance at Moto is kind of. I guess it's a lot more sympathetic, so I'll, I'll spend more time like in the sound checks or trying to listen to the space and tune the frequencies, you know, to, to the environment that we're in. Um, and then in the kind of club, you know, warehouse space later, it's like, I guess that's more of an assault. You know? yeah. It's not really the place for the subtlety so much. Um, do, you, but do you think that in club context you use sound more in a more so-called functional way? No. Well, I was going to say actually, it kind of relates back more to the the high frequency kids on street corner thing, or like the sonic sonic assault stuff. I mean, a lot of a lot of music, you, you know, like for for years, people have used kind of like sirens and these kind of you know like you know fight or flight signifiers within tracks, either consciously or subconsciously, mm -hmm. to create those different states of being. And so I think it's kind of it's an exaggerated form of the same thing. Like perhaps in a more considered listening environment, you're you're trying to create like a visual or like a sensory deprivation effect. I mean, that stuff quite interests me to look at the relationship between the two things, um, the sound and the vision, in a very sort of primitive way. And, then, and also how that kind of, it's perception, right? How, how that changes your perception or how that can play with your perception. But I think in, yeah, it's, it's less, it's kind of less subtle in the, in the club space for sure. Mm. Um, but you're using, you know, similar signifiers, I think, for sure. Yeah.